Welcome everyone to the eighth annual Leicester Human Rights Earth and Film Festival. At tonight's event, we are looking at the question, should Britain legalize cannabis? And uh, to take us through and look at these questions, we've got Dr. Jamie Banks, a Welcome Trust Early Careers Fellow at the University of Leicester, whose research focuses on the colonial and post-colonial histories of drugs and their consumers. He, his current research explores the intersection between cannabis, race, mental illness in Britain in the 1980s and 1990s, with a particular focus on the psychiatric condition, cannabis psychosis, and its disproportionate diagnosis among young African Caribbean men. We've also got Nick Glynn, a senior program officer at the Open Society Foundation and a former police officer. Nick works on police accountability in several European countries with a particular focus on police powers, use of force and racial disparity. We've also got uh, Professor Rob Canton, who is professor in community and criminal justice at De Montfort University. Professor Canton worked in the probation service for more than 20 years and has contributed to the development of probation policy and practice in several countries, particularly in Eastern Europe. He now mainly researches into the practices and ethics of punishment. And we've also got uh, Doug Finn Faust from a Norwegian organization that is calling for the decriminalization of uh, drug purchase, possession and use, and for a shift in Norwegian drug policy towards injury prevention, information and uh, health promoting measures. Now, to give a little bit of context on the issues, in the UK, although medical cannabis has been legal since November the 1st, 2018, and is available for use when prescribed by a registered specialist doctor. Cannabis itself remains a class B drug and is illegal for recreational use. Those caught with cannabis can face up to five years in prison while those involved in its supply or production face up to 14 years behind bars. And despite these laws and penalties, an estimated 2 million people regularly smoke cannabis in the UK, making it the most widely used illegal drug in the, in the country. And also while black people are no more likely to use cannabis than their white counterparts, they are 12 times more likely to be prosecuted for cannabis possession than white people. So to start us off, I hand over to, to Jamie, who will give us his take on the issues. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, Ambrose. And thank you for selling me like far more than is worth it. Um, so before I kind of go into the my academic hat on, I'm going to put my personal hat on. And my personal hat on is that I believe that all drugs should be decriminalized, like kind of overnight should be done, and that we should have really serious discussions about how we leg like legalize drugs in a way that is kind of like kind of safer and more consumer friendly on the one hand but also kind of like provide safeguards in place for people that want to use drugs and to minimize that harm so now that that's out of the way so that's clear what my biases are i'll put my academic hat back on and try and be a little bit more kind of like grounded so sorry that's a skateboard um so in terms of like what my research looks at and then kind of what my views stem from from there. My research for the past year has focused on kind of discussions about cannabis and mental illness in psychiatric literature uh, in Britain in particular, but globally kind of like more broadly. And in particular, what I've been looking at is the way in which a particular condition, cannabis psychosis, became essentially inextricably linked with young black men suffering from kind of like acute cases of mental illness and psychotic disorder um, and it's kind of various aspects that I've been looking at in particular what I've basically been trying to do is contextualize that as not just the product of changes in psychiatric thought or psychiatric thinking but also kind of like changes in Britain 
at the time as well. So, for example, looking at kind of like changing attitudes towards black youth culture, such as Rastafarianism, changing attitudes towards policing, in particular, looking at the involvement of the police in the execution of the Mental Health Act of 1893. Uh, of 1983 even um, and then also looking at things for example like Ambrose was saying kind of misapprehensions about kind of par comparative rates of drug use between white and black communities because um, say it was exactly the same in the 1980s and the 1990s in the sense of people that assumed that Afro-Caribbean communities use drugs more frequently but actually the few surveys that were conducted were either inconclusive or suggested that rates were either comparable or actually lower amongst Afro-Caribbeans than not. And I guess what I'm trying to get at is the fact that like discussions about cannabis have never been grounded in quote unquote objective scientific fact. They've never really been grounded in a discussion, at least from my point of view, about, you know, kind of a balance and check about what are the consequences and side effects, be they psychological or physical, about cannabis on the one hand and what actually are the benefits of cannabis. Instead, what we've always kind of had perpetually, and this is something that I can see both in my research on the British Empire, which I did for my PhD, and then my kind of more recent stuff on Britain in the 1980s and the 1990s, is that, like I said, these you know, nominally scientific discussions and medical discussions about cannabis have always been influenced by social factors and cultural factors, in particular racism and kind of the misidentification of particular ethnic groups with particular kinds of drugs. And as well, kind of like, you know, overreactions from various different arms of the state in enforcing drug laws that don't work. So I guess kind of like where I would stand in terms of why I, why I think this is all important for the discussions we're having now is that if we do have a referendum about decriminalisation or even legalisation in the next few years, I can almost guarantee that those discussions are going to include uh, some sort of debate about the psychological effects of cannabis. And I'll just be clear, I don't think that those debates in and of themselves are a bad thing. You know, as someone that has, you, you know, used cannabis previously in the past and it doesn't necessarily agree with them, I can contest that, you know, it's not a sort of thing that is necessarily safe or has no effect on everybody, right? That is a broad generalisation. But at the same time, what I am saying is that when we have those discussions, we need to be acutely aware of the fact that there is a long-term history of those side effects not being talked about objectively, but being talked about subjectively. And not only being talked about subjectively, but talks about in a way that essentially pathologizes drug use amongst particular groups in society where there's actually no reason for it. Um, and to kind of also just show kind of the contemporary semblance of what I'm talking about in the 1980s and the 1990s, as opposed to it being sort of dead history. If you look at the news recently about the discussions that Ambrose mentioned while we were in the waiting room about drugs, I mean, it was only kind of earlier in the week that people were discussing reefer madness and like kind of fears about the psychological effects of cannabis in exactly the same way that they were in the 80s and the 90s and exactly in the same way they were in America regarding Mexicans in the 1920s, the 1930s, exactly in the same way as they were when they were talking about Indians in Britain, in British India during the 50s and then in the Caribbean during the 1860s and 1870s. So I guess the point that I'm going to leave on is that one, I think, you know, just as a personal hat on, decriminalization is a, a thing that needs to happen just to acknowledge the humanity of people that use drugs because they are people, they're not junkies, they're not drug users, they're people that choose to consume things. But more specifically with my academic hat on, I think that we need to have a long, hard look at the way in which we've understood the psychological effects of cannabis and actually think really long and hard about how much of that is based in scientific facts and how much of that is based in social and cultural factors. Um, and I'll tie it up there, I guess. Hopefully that did the job, Ambrose. Thank you, thank you, Jamie. And then uh, we hear from uh, Nick, Nick Lynn next. Thanks, Ambrose, and thanks, Jamie. All give me a wave if you can hear me, just to sort of make sure that, yeah, that's cool. Right. Um, so, um, so yeah, as Ambrose said, I'm a, I'm a former police officer. I was actually a Leicestershire police officer, um, and uh, I work on policing reform and related justice matters in a number of countries. So I've sort of seen how the war on drugs applies in different places. Um, and... Um, I want to start by saying, um, asking the question really, is prohibition working? Because cannabis is one of several drugs that is subject to prohibition. Is it working? And you might expect me to say no. Um, 
But actually, for some, it is working because the prohibition of cannabis and other drugs is a deliberate policy. It's designed to marginalize, to discriminate. And some of the things that Jamie's just said actually show that um, on the grounds of race, social class, wealth. And from that perspective, it is working. The same politicians advocating being tough on crime weren't the kind of folks to get caught with a joint when they were younger, you know, where they enjoyed it, because the kinds of spaces they did that were not policed. And maybe, as we've heard this week, you know, the House of Commons is another, you know, the cocaine that's located there, it's not policed. Um, prohibition's working when it comes to demonising certain drugs, but not alcohol or caffeine. They're not demonised. Certain drugs are demonised for, for certain reasons, as are the people who use them. <clears throat> and let's not forget, people have always used mood-altering substances, always have, are doing right now, and always will. So the prohibition of cannabis criminalizes in the UK thousands and thousands of people every year. And that has lifelong consequences for them and the people around them. But again, it's only certain groups or it tends to be certain groups that are disproportionately affected by that. Prohibition also works for organized crime because it helps them. It's an illegal market. If the market wasn't illegal, organized crime couldn't take advantage of it. The fact that it's illegal puts them in charge and they are in charge of the market largely. Um, and this, the war on drugs is a never ending war, that never end, never be won. Um, it's getting more and more expensive. Big business are a big fan of uh, cannabis and other drugs being criminalized because they make money out of it selling tasers and the latest new equipment and kit for policing and security to fight this war on drugs. Um, and even after all of that, tonight in Leicester or wherever else you might be watching this from, you could buy cannabis as easy as you could buy lemonade or chocolate, you know, if you, if, if you wanted to, you can easily buy it. Even after all of that effort and 50 years of it and more, um, it doesn't work. Um, I've spoken to a number of groups of police officers about um, their use of drugs, like, you know, Chatham House rules, have you ever used drugs? One group I spoke to, there's about 40 police officers there, 75% of them put their hand up and said that they'd used drugs. And they hadn't turned into addicts, into burglars, or all of these other things that, you know, demonize with people who use, who use drugs. Second point I'd like to make is, you know, in terms of the resistance to change is policing of drugs is exciting, as is the whole aura around it. We all know Narcos, The Wire, Snowfall, all of these great shows um, that, that, you know, make millions and are very popular. Policing itself of, of drugs is, is, you know, fascinating. One of the most exciting things I ever did in the police was hiding in the back of a fake post van that we used to do a drugs raid because the fake post ban meant that the people would open the door and we could get straight in. And we found a tiny bit of cannabis in that house, which justified the whole operation that had cost no doubt thousands of pounds. Um, Leicestershire police in the last couple of months, 60 to 70%, as is similar to the national figure of their stop searches are for drugs, not for weapons, not for stolen property, for drugs. So it's big business for them. And it's a great photo opportunity as well um, for, for, um, for politicians and the police to sort of show that they're doing something. So if we change things, maybe policing will be a little less exciting as will the, the shows that, that focus on it. Um, but maybe also then we wouldn't need to struggle to find the 20,000 police officers that have already been cut by this government that they're now trying to refine. So, so maybe there'd be some, uh, some positives there. And it's no surprise either that there are very few voices inside policing or for people who've ever been inside policing who advocate for change because the status quo sort of works for many. Um, but of course, as, as well as being exciting, the war on drugs brings terrible things. Serious violence, kidnappings, often kidnappings. The issue behind a kidnapping is a 50 pound drug debt. 
it's not some serious issue that's gone on. It's these, that's that's how powerful this war on drugs gets. So you know, it's dangerous. It's tragic. Sometimes deadly, um, and uh, and you know, never ending. Imagine what we could do with all those resources if we did something different with them. Which is my final point: is so yes to legalizing cannabis as a first step because it's just a first step and maybe we need to do decriminalization first but actually why not learn the lessons from other places and um, we'll hear from Norway in a bit but learn the lessons from other places like um, uh, some of the states in the US so Colorado was the first one really to legalize cannabis most recently and they made a load of mistakes in their process and the states that have followed have learned some of those lessons. Um, and New York being the most, the, the, the most recent, have learned some of those lessons. So just a quick example of something they've learned is to not, as Colorado did, banned anybody with any sort of conviction or involvement in the illegal drug trade from being part of the legalized drug trade. Why should they be banned from it? Um, some of the resources that, um, that we wouldn't need for policing can go to welfare and education and health and to help you know, harm reduction for, for the tiny minority of people who might have problematic drug use, like we get with alcohol and with, with other drugs. Um, and the final thing I'd say, and again, this is as far as reform is concerned, uh, something that's often missed is, if we're going to change the laws on drugs, which I think we should, expunge those convictions of the people who were convicted of possession in the past, take them off their record because they have a lifelong impact. And so we could have a lifelong positive impact by reforming, you know, with the best examples from around Europe and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. And uh, next we hear from uh, Professor Rob Cantor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a moment and show you some PowerPoint slides. And I hope you'll forgive me for doing that, but it'll spare you from having to look at me the whole time. Um, I Here we go. Let's see if I can do this. OK, I, I'm hoping now that um, and perhaps colleagues can give me a thumbs up if uh, you can see a screen. Thank you so much. Uh, that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, I know less about this topic than most of the other main speakers, uh, but I accepted the invitation because I've thought a lot in recent years and about the whole matter of criminalization. Um, and I think that cannabis for me represents a really interesting test case about what the criminal law could be, should be, and what it amounts to. And I begin by um, showing a, 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 a picture, a screenshot from uh, an article that my friend Nick Glynn wrote um, a, a year or more ago about decriminalizing cannabis. And I'm sure Nick remembers this and he was kind enough to make it available to me because it normally sits behind a paywall at the Times, doesn't it, Nick? Um, but you'll know that when articles like this appear, there's a comments section and the comments are really, really interesting. And among the comments that Nick's uh, piece attracted were these. Well, while we're at it, let's also legalize burglary, mudding, mugging and assault. Let's give the police a rest. And on that basis, decriminalize absolutely everything and so on and so on and so on. So the person who put these comments, I imagine, thought that this is a knockdown argument. You know, this is the end of it. Well, let's just decriminalize everything. But in fact, it does raise some really rather quite interesting questions about what we think the law can accomplish and what the consequences are of legalizing things. There's a distinguished uh, Norwegian criminologist who Dagfin will certainly know and some other listeners may as well, the late Niels Christie, who wrote a very influential book a few years ago called A Suitable Amount of Crime. And Christie began by distinguishing crimes from undesirable acts. Now, the question whether cannabis is an undesirable act is one to which we may cho choose to return. But for now, let's park that particular one and just concentrate on this distinction. So what Christie is saying is that there are all sorts of things take place in society that we would prefer did not take place. But in fact, the criminal law is rarely the only 
often far from the best, and more often than suppose, barely a credible way of reducing these acts. So we hope that it will, but we set out to do this and we end up causing a number of problems uh, on the way without any clear effect on the incidents. In the United Kingdom, and for all I know in many other countries, probably the USA and other countries like that, uh, uncivilized countries, um, the incidents of, we become culturally preoccupied with thinking that the answer to all social problems is criminalization. And I don't think this is too much ancient history, uh, but in the high days of the Blair government, the following acts were turned into crimes. So you'll be disappointed to know that you can no longer swim in the wreck of the Titanic. You can't sell game birds if they were shot on Sundays or disturb a pack of eggs when you've been told not to. <clears throat> and astonishingly, it has now become a criminal offence knowingly to cause a nuclear weapon explosion. And I'm sure that uh, seeing that you'll all be deeply reassured and feel a great deal safer. Why do we get into all of this? Well, if we're trying to decide what should and should not be a crime, the most famous principle that often uh, uh, appears in, in dialogue and debate in, uh, in British politics rests on the principle articulated by the great utilitarian philosopher John Stuart Mill, who said the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised is to prevent harm to others. <clears throat> and I think Mill's concern has channeled the debate into the question about whether cannabis is harmful. And if you look at the comments that came in to Nick's article, and when this is debated, people will tell you about all the harms that it causes and others will say, well, no, it's not that harmful or it is harmful, but it's not as harmful as alcohol or, to, or tobacco and so forth. But what is often eliminated from this discussion is the harms of criminalization. We assume that criminalization is, is benign and that all it does is stop bad people from doing bad things. But in fact, criminalization can cause enormous harm. There's a discussion of a gateway, isn't it? And here's a comment that came from another person who uh, re reacted to Nick. The suggestion that it's some sort of gateway, as if we're all sort of dying to take cannabis. Um, and if we do take cannabis, we'll immediately be hooked and then we'll be reeled in and we'll take all these horrible other substances as well. And until you've worked with these people, as this respondent claims to have done, you don't have a clue what damage does. But I'd got to this point of uh, the idea of cannabis being a gateway, a gateway into something and the suggestion that um, if you take it, you'll end up using heroin or cocaine. Everyone took cannabis first and then progressed. And I was, uh, I'm following Nick again in saying that, uh, and here this is a quotation, the trade in illegal drugs has fostered a massive increase in organized and often violent crime. It's ensnared young children into the county line supply chains. It's often killed its own customers by selling them lethal combinations and so on and so on. This metaphor of a war on drugs, which people speak about quite a lot politically, you can't have a war on drugs, can you? If you think about it, you can no more have a war on drugs than you can have a war on crime. Um, you can't wage war on substances. So what a war on drugs can only mean is a war on drug users or drug dealers um, or uh, individuals, human beings. And an American scholar, I think, put this beautifully. Before I say this, sorry, I just say that the and when we talk about a war on drugs, are we talking about what this is a very ugly metaphor, isn't it? This is a civil war. Are we? Is it a racial war? Is it a class war? Is it a war of the powerful against the weaker, the war against the older against the younger? These are ugly ideas. And I think that uh, when we talk about the war on drugs, we should think about that. But an American scholar, Eko Yanka, has said the current war on drugs leads besides leading to the arrest and conviction of millions has visited pain in deeply racialized lashes yoking countless young people with a felony record that often prevents them from seeking an education or holding a job it's hollowed out neighborhoods gutted families and all but guaranteed failed communities and generations so my main point is that is to emphasize the harms of criminalization and the limits of what it can plausibly achieve. 
the only certain consequence of creating crimes is to create criminals. Enforcement unfairly applied breeds contempt, distrust and disrespect for the law, while its impact on incidents is often speculative. And in general, I think, not only in relation to drugs, certainly not only in relation to cannabis, but a reliance on policing and punishment is often ineffective and causes untold damage to individuals, families and communities. Now, many, when I, um, when I asked Ambrose why I'd been invited to participate, he reminded me of a piece that I wrote in the Leicester Mercury a couple of years ago. And a, a local Conservative MP replied to my piece and he rested his case on the harms that he'd witnessed and he told, wrote all about people whose lives had been completely wrecked. But whenever we hear arguments of that kind, we should always bear in mind that harms like this are occurring in a society in which cannabis is already illegal. And perhaps they're occurring because cannabis is illegal. That's me done and thank you for listening and apologies for the technical hazards. Thank, thank you, thank you very much Rob. Uh... And then we hear from, from Dakin. Thank you. Um, so I was asked to speak uh, from sort of an international perspective. Uh, I can only speak from the Norwegian perspective, I guess. Uh, we were all bound by our perspectives. But um, so I will quickly just introduce myself and my, my organization. I'm um, Dakin Paust. I'm originally a criminal defense lawyer and I work in the Association for Safer Drug Policies in Norway. We are an NGO uh, founded in 2016, working for drug policy reform in Norway and the Nordics. And we also have a, a sister organization in Sweden that came along just after us. So um, we, we work uh, primarily for uh, harm prevention based drug policies and, uh, and human rights based drug policies. So decriminalization is sort of at the core of what we do. Uh, that was our our sort of uh, raison d'etre when we uh, started. And um, also we, we have been active in the legalization debate uh, and the debate on the regulation of various illicit and illicit substances. Um, so uh, quickly, I'll just talk a, a little bit first about the, uh, the decriminalization process in Norway that some may have heard of through the news. In um, 2016, the Norwegian uh, drug policy reform debate, drug policy debate had been very active for a few years um, with a, a growing NGO community. Uh, There's a big uh, civil society movement in, in Norway and we were very lucky to get government funding for organizations working in the civil society in drug policy. Um, and there had been a lot of media buzz uh, about drug policy in, in the wake of MDMA coming back and uh, um, Washington, Colorado, Uruguay, legalizing cannabis. A lot of stuff was happening around 2014, 15. And um, in 2016, our health minister at the time, Bentoya, had a change of heart uh, and all of a sudden decided to look to Portugal. And he wanted Norway to decriminalize all drugs, Portugal style. He persuaded his party, the conservative party, actually, um, who was uh, the ruling party at the time, and um, they um, eventually um, landed a platform the following year with the government, the coalition government, um, that they would uh, have an expert committee make a model, a proposal for a decriminalization model. Um, and in 2019, the committee had um, presented its proposal. This proposal was a 400 page report, uh, extremely comprehensive, detailing the, the history of Norwegian drug policy and, and uh, all the like the philosophical uh, criminal legal arguments. Um, there was a very impressive roster of um, um, lawyers and other experts in this in this committee, and um, they very convincingly and impressively presented a, a model that was more progressive than the Portuguese model. So in the Portuguese model, there are administrative fines still for, for these offenses, even though they're not criminal. In this model, there would be no administrative fines. There would just be an obligation to report to, to uh, counseling. And uh, the model was slightly modified later on by the politicians because it was so radical and progressive. So that if you didn't report to counseling, you could have an administrative fine, but it would not be for the drug offense. Um, 
So fast forward to um, this year, um, the process of this bill was uh, unfortunately delayed by COVID-19. And uh, there was also a slight glitch along the way with one of the parties of the coalition government uh, exiting the government. So all of a sudden there was no longer a majority in support of the bill. Everybody thought that the Labour Party would save the bill eventually, but um, because of the delay in COVID-19, this happened in an election year and the Labour Party decided to quash the bill. So the bill is now dead, but there are talks about reviving it. There are talks about trialing it only in Oslo. Uh, and it seems that popular support for decriminalization in Norway has really seen a tremendous boost in the past year or so. So it, it's likely that most Norwegians actually support this reform, even though it wasn't, um, it didn't go through. So uh, I don't think it's dead. I think it's going to make a comeback. But in the meantime, which is what we're discussing here today, uh, things are happening in Europe. So Germany just announced that they are legalizing cannabis. And this changes everything, of course. Uh, Norway is not part of the EU, but we are in the EEA area. So this very much affects us and culturally as well. Now the discussion on cannabis legalization is flourishing once again. Um, it had been flourishing as well before this decriminalization process, but we sort of had this unofficial moratorium on the legalization debate while this was going on, also in the NGOs. Uh, don't, don't talk about legalization right now, right? Uh, and that's, that's now over. So now the questions arise uh, that I find to be the most interesting. Uh, I, I like these, these discussions on not whether to legalize uh, or regulate the markets, but how to do it. so. And um, I think that this, this is often glossed over in, in the also in the drug policy reform community. There are a lot of very interesting uh, and challenging questions to, to answer. And of course, we have, some, we have some experience now from other countries. We have um, states in the US that have done so. We have Canada. There are some years of data to, to look at. Uh, and of course, we have many, many years of experience with alcohol and tobacco and, and whatnot. But um, I think that the, the obvious benefits of a legal market uh, are clear, right? So a product that can be taxed uh, so that you can pay for the harms and the costs of the regulations, that's always good. Today, the product exists, the harms are real. Uh, we're, we're regulating it through criminalization, but we're not really paying for it if you look, you know, if you don't consider fines to be, to be a payment, right? Um, organized crime, uh, doesn't profit from, from legal products. That's a big no-brainer as well uh, in favor of legalization. And also legal users or legal consumers uh, are not recruited into organized crime uh, through the product they're consuming, which is the case today. We, even children are being recruited into, into drug dealing because they get involved in a criminal economy. Also, if you make cannabis legal, then you have the obvious benefit of age limits being imposed. So you can ensure that only adults may purchase it legally. Um, you also then indirectly ensure that minors would have to acquire it through uh, some uh, adult that is purchasing it, purchasing it legally. So you have some sort of gatekeeper effect at, at worst. Um, and a very important thing is that you can start to regulate potency, product potency. So this has been a big thing in recent years with uh, the, um, the, the concern for cannabis-induced psychoses um, and the risk of, of such psychoses being much higher with the products that have a much higher potency and, and the higher THC to CBD ratio, um, if anyone is familiar with those terms. But then there are some difficult questions about legalization as well. Um, for one, a, a drug that isn't as widespread already as for instance, alcohol is, might become more widespread. Consumption might increase as availability increases with legalization. Um, decriminalization might not have that effect. There's very little evidence for that. And legalization might not have a very a large effect on that in some societies. But in societies where consumption is lower, the, perhaps the effect is larger. And it also depends on the, the model. Um, and here we get into some of these epidemiological perspectives that at least where I come from have been very strong in, in the, the alcohol policies, these notions of the total consumption model. So if average consumption increases, excessive consumption also increases. Um, there are questions of whether alcohol and cannabis are 
additive or substitutive? Does increased cannabis consumption uh, affect alcohol consumption? Uh, and in what direction does it mediate uh, harmful effects of, of, of alcohol? Does it attenuate them? Um, these are difficult questions, and it seems to be a mixed bag when you look at the research. Um, and then you also have the, the worry that even, even moderate consumption, if many more consume the drug moderately, then the sum of harms, the total, can still be greater. This is the, the so-called prevention paradox. And then you have these trade-off effects, the balloon effects, where if you reduce um, availability through a regulated legal market, so the illicit availability is reduced, um, and you make it more expensive, so you reduce affordability through taxation, then uh, you're, you're fueling illicit distribution again. So if you have a very restrictive illicit market, then the, the illicit market might still survive. And this is also a problem if, uh, if you don't integrate the former, uh, the former drug dealers into this new economy, which uh, was already covered by a previous speaker here. So, so there are some, some difficult problems. Um, and you also have the industry incentives um, where the, um, the cannabis industry, a legal cannabis industry, would make most of its profits from a small group of people um, that that generate most of the consumption and therefore most of the revenue, right? This is a sort of Pareto principle and economic theory. So what we work with, uh, to make a long story short, at the moment are models for um, at ha having having ways to deal with all of these these pitfalls because there are ways. So one of these ways is to approach um, approach regulation not from the perspective of making a legal drug more expensive, for instance, so that people will not consume too much of it, but rather perhaps um, having some kind of rationing system so people can only buy uh, a certain amount of grams of cannabis in a month. Um, this makes it possible to have the cannabis still be affordable so you can compete with the illicit market. Uh, it also means that the people who have a very high consumption will still buy illicit product before going to the illicit market. There's also less um, risk of diversion to minors outside of this system and many other interesting effects. And we're also looking into um, ways to um, apply regulatory devices from gambling systems today, like uh, commitment contracts uh, that could be um, implemented in some digital system where people are using uh, like personalized apps, um, encryption technology to regulate their own consumption in a way that isn't entirely paternalistic and still um, very effective at curbing overconsumption and harmful consumption. So I think I'll just leave it at that. And uh, if anybody <laughs> wants to know what these solutions are in detail, I can, I can talk for hours about that. So I won't bother you with that now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dakin. Um, I don't know, if, is there, is there anyone who wants to ask a question? If you've got a question and you'd like to ask it, you know, please, uh, uh, you can unmute and ask a question, uh, or you can put it in the chat. Uh, yes, Jamie. I was, I was going to say, if I could use my speaker's privilege, could I ask Nick a question, if that's all right? Yeah, sure. I'm just very curious with your, like, previous background in the police, Nick. Do you get a sense of kind of where current and active like police officers sit in terms of the decriminalization debate like is it kind of like a 50 50 split in terms of what people think or is it kind of like more and more way and also just kind of more broadly what justifications do they give for that opinion so i realize it's really open-ended but just given that you're here i'd love to ask sure yeah i mean um I don't have any stats on it and, and I don't think any research has ever been done on that sort of on the views inside policing on that, which would be interesting, I'm sure. Um, but but from my sort of, um, you know, contacts and connections and the sense that you get from having been in it and, and, and knowing how people think, I mean, there's several camps, really. There's one camp that is very much, you know, it's the law. And also what we do is the police is we enforce the law. And um, and actually, as I was saying in the in the bit that I did, you know, it's actually quite interested and exciting all of that stuff. So they're very much, you know, for the status quo. Um, there is there's another cohort I think who feel that 
they see the futility, especially I think around cannabis, why it's really good that this is a subject today around cannabis itself. Um, because if you ask you know, frontline police officers, what causes you problems in terms of substances, they're gonna say alcohol 99% of the time. You know, when they go to, to, to difficult incidents, it is alcohol that causes, um, is the factor there not cannabis that's not to say that there aren't you know some incidents where um, other drugs are, are a factor but you know alcohol is the issue there i always remember a an officer sitting in a in a meeting room one time when we were talking about this and he said until the chief constable tells me that i can walk past somebody smoking a joint and don't have to do anything about it i'm going to enforce the law um and so in a sense I do feel as though the police are stuck in the middle here of this and there's different motivations for reasons why they don't speak up and people inside police and don't really speak up about it apart from a few so Mike Barton the, the the retired the recently retired chief constable of Durham police Durham constabulary he he said you know my officers got better things to do than be worrying about somebody growing a cannabis plant in there you know get, you know we're not interested um, but even there, the officers themselves are not backed by the law. And so I really do think even decriminalisation is, is a bit of a halfway step, really. And what they would probably welcome more, or those that are open minded enough to see that this is the way forward, um, would be legalisation, a change in the law. So they can say it's nothing to do with us anymore you know, in term, because it's not illegal anymore. So it's not, it's not our interest. And I think um, a good proportion of police officers would welcome that because they have got better things to do and they've got more serious and important things to do. And then you take that broader to the whole issue around the um, prohibition and criminalization of drugs as a whole. And that's a whole other ball game because, you know, um, uh, much of their work is connected in some way to, um, to the illegal drugs market. And it would be transformative to, for that not to exist anymore. Okay, lovely, thank you. That was a really interesting answer. Is, is there anyone else uh, among our panelists who wants to comment on or ask a question to uh, fellow panelists? Yes, Nick. This is this has been a <laughs> speaker's privilege. Yeah. So, I, I, Dagfin, I've got some questions around, or a question around um, the um, the operating models in places where this has been done well. So, I know a little about this, but um, I don't know a great deal about the stuff in the US. But I get the sense that um, there's a risk in terms of decriminalisation and legalisation of big business and corporations getting involved, and you know, the small cooperatives who run a, a cannabis cafe in Barcelona being pushed out. And I wondered whether you got any insights into that kind of issue. That's definitely a, a big issue. Uh, and I don't claim to have all the answers. I don't think anybody does, uh, because that is, um, you know, this is a, a dilemma, I guess, uh, where you're replacing the, um, the drug cartels with the you know, worst worst case scenario, you get something like big tobacco, right? Which is another kind of evil. Uh, maybe not as bad in every way, but but it it has some seriously negative um, sides to it as well. Uh, and then the question is, what kind of models are um, are appropriate for for preventing this? Because certainly, legal cannabis at the moment is not big tobacco. You know, these companies are not big enough. They're not that powerful. Um, and you have some different approaches to this. Uh, in, in Barcelona, like you said, you have these um, the cannabis social clubs, which are nonprofit um, organizations. And uh, they came about through necessity, right? They had to circumvent the UN uh, drug conventions. So, so they're not technically, um, you know, cannabis isn't legalized in Barcelona. But what they're doing is that they have a bunch of people going together, forming a club, and then they're they're growing for their own consumption. It's just that they're outsourcing the growing to somebody in the club who's better at it, 
that's the thought, right? And then there are some legal processes in Spain right now with the Supreme Court saying that you can't, you can't be too industrialized doing this. Uh, so the loophole might be closing. But I, I think that's kind of sad because that model is really interesting for a number of reasons. One thing is the nonprofit model. Uh, I don't think nonprofits is, is, is necessarily the only way to go for a, a responsible model. But um, another thing is that the fact that they have these, um, it's a rationing system. If you grow in the cannabis social club, you can only, um, you can only get so many grams of cannabis out per month. Um, and you can only you can only get so many grams uh, per visit and so on. And when I was in Barcelona visiting one of these clubs, um, I um, I discovered that the, the club I visited had also implemented a commitment contract, which I'm a big fan of. So you could actually um, you could decide for yourself what your limit should be until a, a maximum limit. Uh, so that that would be your like the 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 absolute amount that you could get every time you visited the club just for like a future sort of restriction on yourself. Um, there are also some interesting things going on in the US with like um, vertical integration models being uh, banned because um, there have been some, some compliance issues, some issues with the black market sort of flowing into the, the, the legal market. Um, but I think that the fundamental issue, which nobody has really solved yet, except for maybe the nonprofit model, is that um, you get this with alcohol and tobacco today as well. You have this Pareto distribution of the consumption. So 20% are consuming 80% of the product and 80% are consuming only 20% of the product, roughly speaking. But there's a lot of science on this showing that this is roughly the distribution for most drugs, illicit and illicit drugs. Um, roughly speaking. And the, the problem then is that the, the people who have a drug problem are the most profitable consumers. Like 17% of cocaine users are consuming two thirds of all the cocaine. Guess what? 17% of cocaine users go on to become dependent on cocaine. So it's, it's pretty much, you know, the, the core audience are the people with a drug problem. Um, and how do you deal with that, right? Um, whether it's an illicit market or an illicit market, as long as one unit of the drug costs the same every time, and whatever tax you have on that unit is the same every time, it's always going to be like that. So one thing I'm working on, I haven't published the paper yet, but I'm working on a model where that tax portion is actually variable. So it, it depends on what your consumption is, which is, which is measured by this proxy, which is your, your, um, your self-decided limit. Uh, and with that type of, of um, sort of technocratic approach, you could have some very different um, dynamics. You could actually have a situation where the industry has an incentive to reduce the excessive consumer's consumption to make more money. Uh, but that's, I guess, a bit futuristic for, for some people. Yeah, yes, 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 Rob, and then Nick. Um, yes, I'm sorry if I'm changing the topic and Nick might want to come back to Dagfin's really important points here, because I think I've been too, in my thinking sometimes, to not thought through some of the implications. And as you put it, Dagfin, the best way of, of managing this and some of the consequences that don't immediately occur. The point I'd wanted to make is whether you can help us from your knowledge of other countries to understand whether all these countries... Um, talk about it in the same aggressive way do other countries have this idea of a war this very powerful very hostile metaphor and i've got this vision of people sitting reading their newspapers around the breakfast table and warming themselves up with righteous indignation on a cold winter morning um why war why do we talk about it in that way and is there are there other and better ways in which we could try to frame a debate so that it isn't talked about in, in, with such aggression. Do other countries talk about war in relation to this, which is bizarre, really, if you think about it? It occurs to me that Jamie might have, you know, also have some thoughts about that historically, about the emergence of a particular way of discussing uh, this problem. I'm just curious to know what you think. Uh, I don't know if Dagfin wants to go first or if you... I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in quickly just because Dagfin a little bit of space. I mean, like, I'm not an American historian, so 
my thoughts are purely based upon British imperial and colonial history. But I would not be surprised to suggest that, you know, all the stuff that happened under Reagan introducing the narrative of, of a war on drugs is kind of perhaps why we continue to talk about it now. Like something that I, I wanted to look at and haven't had a chance to look at yet because busy is whether or not kind of like Thatcher kind of invoked similar kind of narratives of a war on drugs because of her relationship with Reagan. Uh, and I was talking to uh, the archivist at Churchill College in Oxford. So he's the person that looks after all the Thatcher papers. And his attitude was a bit like, well, actually, Thatcher didn't really care that much about drugs. It's very much more people in her cabinet. Now, I don't know how true or not that is, but I guess the point of what I'm trying to say is that it definitely does seem to be a case of essentially an adoption of a narrative born of American policy mores that kind of has been, you know, adopted to be the way, you know, the dominant, I hate to use the word paradigm, but it, the dominant discourse that we use to talk about drugs. Um, because like I said, if you look back into the colonial period, so the deep dark recesses of time, if you look kind of in the, the 1800s, there's not a talk of a war on drugs for colonial authorities. It's all about balancing the mores of how can we make money from this versus how do we limit the kind of amount of harm that's caused. Now, that isn't me saying that colonial opium policies or colonial cannabis policies were something that we should abide by, because obviously, you know, it's colonialism. The mores of colonialism aren't particularly humanitarian. But like coming from just the objective standpoint of what they were trying to achieve, they were basically doing the stuff that we're proposing now in terms of, you know, if you so to, to raise the stuff that I looked at at the Caribbean, it, you don't have to look that far to see models which are, you know, licensing systems for people that want to sell it, signage on stores so it's obvious who is selling cannabis, laws about what drugs you could and couldn't sell together so you couldn't own a rum shop and also sell cannabis as well or sell opium as well daily purchase limits on how much people could buy in a 24-hour period, taxes on introduction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that I don't think this narrative is kind of like a, a universal or kind of like buried in the deep recesses of time. I think this is something that's come out very, very recently and kind of has essentially, you know, pointed the discussion about drugs as like you said Rob, a war on drugs as opposed to a conversation about how do we manage drugs and drug related harm in a way that is effective if nothing else but yeah that's just my musings on the matter i, I i'm not familiar with uh, the rhetoric in that many countries but um my, my experience from from my region of, of europe is that uh the war rhetoric has never really been that, um, you know, that much in, at the front of it. I think the epidemiological perspective has been much more dominating here. Um, the, the idea of social contagion. So um, also in alcohol policy, for that matter, uh, it's been a, a meme sort of that um, someone who consumes a drug um, is a bad role model for their, you know, their fellow citizens, basically, or, or they're influencing people through their behavior, through their way of life. So even if they don't themselves use a drug in a way that it really harms them or harms people around them directly, it somehow um, inspires other people to self-harm or inspires other people to use drugs in ways that escalate and become irresponsible. So we, we've had this, this uh, you know, for, for, for decades, this interesting, uh, and I would say quite unique, if you, if, you know, before COVID, it was unique, right? And then we were reminded that there was actually something called pandemics, where you see the same thing, where, it's, where public health and criminal law fuse. And uh, it, it can be quite perverse, because criminal law is governed, at least in, uh, you know, liberal democracies, uh, by some liberal principles. And it, it's a question of whether you are actually causing harm to someone else's uh, legitimate interests. It's not a question of whatever macro socioeconomic effect uh, the rules may have. And in the area of drug policy, this has been completely eroded. So, so this, uh, the idea of, of just macro public health uh, aggregate effects uh, has been dominating in, in my country, I would say. I think 
Ambrose, if it's okay, I'll just add a little. Uh, I did. It was. I was saying thanks to Dagpin before, but but I just say that maybe um, to, to answer Rob's question about the war on drugs in other countries, maybe that phrase isn't used, but the rhetoric and the imagery is really present. If you think about, you know, photos, videos, footage of seizures of drug seizures and how they are celebrated um, by the police and security services and customs and, um, uh, and and other sort of state agencies that is quite universal actually um, so this sense of uh, of we're all in this battle together is certainly there and is demonstrated frequently even if that maybe that phrase isn't so widespread it's just that I think the, you know, the war, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing seems to be a fairly common human sentiment. So why you should go around looking for wars and wanting to proclaim them and be proud of the fact that you're waging them is a little bit of a mystery. And it occurs to me as well, on pain of quoting too many things, uh, they say the first casualty of war is truth. So similarly in the drug debate, uh, the first thing that happens is that you set aside evidence you don't bother with any of that because you are now pursuing a, a course a, a cause you're on a crusade and and everything flows from that and to question it in the way that we're wanting to question it tonight risks becoming an act of treason and it then becomes extremely difficult to articulate this so among ourselves and for all i know many of our audience we are of a mind there's a lot of agreement among us although there may be some disagreements but we have to recognize don't we that in the in the wider world many people believe that if it's only the legal the uh, the criminalization that stops us all from taking cannabis we're all dying to take cannabis just like we're all dying to set off nuclear explosions but thank heavens the criminal law is to prevent that is there to prevent that taking place. And, and if we did all go off and take cannabis, the next thing we'd all be doing is lying in gutters with needles in our arms. You know, this is all sort of such nonsense, but I think I'm interested to know how much of that flows from this invocation of this very lazy and very nasty war metaphor. Yeah. And, and also, uh, to, to pick on, 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 on that uh, image of war and uh, one of the effects of that war comes from what happens when we look at uh, statistics around uh, policing, how especially cannabis is policed, that uh, the people who are criminalized the most uh, are black when they are no more likely to use cannabis than their white counterparts. Uh, does anyone want to say something on that? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't mind if, if uh, I'll jump in at least for a little. Um, just to highlight some really good work actually by an organization called Release, who have done a couple of reports, one being uh, the numbers in black and white, um, which talks about race disparity in how drugs are policed in the UK and they did an update of that report as well so um, I'll maybe share those in the chat if I can do it while we're on this um, on this call um, but but um, but yeah I mean I think uh, the way in which these laws are policed is is you know is disproportionate when you look at one of the things I didn't mention when I did my piece earlier was if you look at the strategic threat and risk assessments of the 43 police forces in England and Wales, drug possession, possession of cannabis is nowhere. And yet so much policing activity is focused upon it, which is a real you know, contradiction and a bit of a mystery really. And I think one of the reasons that is the case is because it's easy, it's actually easy work um, most of the time, stopping and searching somebody for cannabis is not risky uh, or no more inherently risky than anything else. Um, a lot of the time, nothing's found. A lot of the time, there's no conflict. 
but of course we know all of the damage and um, um, that, that those encounters, those police, police initiated encounters have in the short, medium and long term. Um, and so, um, again, I think it's, um, it goes back to Rob's point really about criminalizing things. The police will pick and choose what they deal with and what they don't. We've got a very good example of that this week with Christmas parties having happened in the past and therefore cannot be investigated because they happened in the past. The police choose what they investigate, what they focus on and what they don't. And drugs is relatively easy as well as being interesting, exciting, you know, sexy policing and all of that sort of stuff. So, um, so that's why some of those choices are made, I think. Um, I don't mind jumping in either, just simply because I am the mug that went and put race as one of the things I talk about in my research. Um, and I think, so to use my specific example to talk to more broader issues, for one, I think it isn't that controversial to suggest that pretty much from time, well, modern time and memorial, particular groups are associated rightly or wrongly with particular substances for no other reason than we kind of have a nat natural inclination to kind of like other people that aren't ourselves, right? But to talk more specifically about like kind of what I do, so to talk actual research for a bit, um, when you look at the stuff about cannabis psychosis, it's really clear really quite quickly how important notions about race are when it comes to diagnosing this condition. So if you look about the literature that talks about cannabis and psychological effects kind of before the 80s, like there's pretty much no, it's, it's colorblind in the sense that like, there's actually very little discussion about it in British periodicals. And that which is discussing it is pretty much like, it's sort of like race is completely absent from it. You know, it's the odd case study which talks about, oh, a, a girl in London was admitted to a psychiatric ward for smoking a bit of hash in a flat in Chelsea. But there's no mention of, oh, this, this lady was, yes, you know, this lady or this woman was, was black or white. Whereas after 1984, in particular, the, the publication of Carney et al's study, which looks at admissions to Shenley Hospital, race becomes increasingly prominent. And to put that kind of like in context, within, I think it's two or three years, a survey that looked at psychiatric admissions to Samwell Hospital in Birmingham found that Afro-Caribbean patients were 95 times more likely to be diagnosed with cannabis psychosis than patients that were white. And I think that really just puts into perspective the, the kind of like the fact of the racial disparities that happen. And part of what I was trying to unpick in my research is just basically ask, well, why, right? You know, what, why is this the case? And more specifically, look at some of the justifications that were sort of offered by psychiatrists at the time, but not really followed up as to why these imbalances existed. Where did they come from, right? Because it, it isn't the actual diagnosis itself. Like when you look at the literature itself, it's actually like a really flimsy diagnosis in the sense of there's no discrete conditions about it. Symptomology is completely all up in the air. And there's people that are like, it doesn't, you know, it's not even got any tangible basis in fact. And when you start to look at the social factors, you see how much they actually play a role in sort of the creation and the perpetuation of this particular diagnosis. So like I mentioned before, kind of like the implicit association of cannabis with Rastafari communities and the fact that Rastafari is also very much tied with the rise of black youth culture in Britain means that you essentially have this motif of the Rastafari as the kind of psychotic deranged patient suffering from cannabis psychosis. Um, you also have a really lovely quote I mean, not lovely given the context, but it sums it up really well, of a community support worker uh, in the Midlands who gave an interview to a paper by a guy called Chris Ranger, who was basically like, it feels amongst the community that psychiatrists see a, see a black person with dreads, assume that they're Rastafarian, and therefore think that, oh, it's obviously cannabis that's causing the mental illness, right? And I think that just gives a clear example kind of, of like the jumps that get made at various times. Now, like I said, you know, I'm talking about stuff that was kind of happening in the 1980s and the 1990s. But I think the particular case of cannabis psychosis, you know, is just one in a long history of cannabis in particular and drugs more generally being associated with particular ethnic groups for no other reason than, you know, that's how it seems to be by kind of like the powers that be. Yes, yes, I agree. Just like to comment briefly on cannabis psychosis because this is a very interesting topic. I think, um, and there have been 
Uh, I mean, one thing is, is uh, racial prejudice. Uh, another thing is um, there has been a lot of research historically that has associated cannabis use with, um, with a higher incidence of psychosis by um, having questionnaires of the sort that would uh, conflate symptoms of acute intoxication with symptoms of psychotic illness. Uh, and I, I guess this stems perhaps from this lack of, of phenomenological understanding of, from people having no experience with cannabis themselves or, or not really realizing uh, you know, what is common and what is not. But, but uh, you, know, you, you have science, junk science, uh, from, from you know, many years showing that, that the, the risk of, of psychosis is increasing just because people are replying that, yes, I have had you know, auditory hallucinations or paranoia or something uh, you know, at, at some point in my life and I've smoked cannabis. So, so this is, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of junk science to wade through. Uh, and, and another thing that has been pointed out in, in recent years, at least in, in Norway, I, I know because of the decriminalization debate has been that there was a 20 fold increase in admissions for cannabis induced psychosis in Portugal following decriminalization. And anybody who knows anything about the, the data from Portugal knows that there is no way in hell that that actually reflects an increase in cannabis use because this country had something like 1% of the population using heroin before the, the drug policy reform. And then the, the overdose uh, statistics basically plummeted because they managed to, to fix their society. There, there has not been such an increase in the consumption of cannabis or its potency or anything like that, for sure. And yet we see numbers like that, which goes to show that, that the reporting and the diagnostic practices uh, can be all over the place. So it, it's really a tricky, yeah, tr tricky field to navigate the science. Yeah, let's jump, jump. Sorry, Ambrose, can I just quickly jump off the back of what Bagfin said as well? Because I think also what you've got to bear in mind is that like, it's really complex because there's a load, there's a load of different discussions going on about different relationships between different forms of mental illness that all get kind of bounded together. So what I was looking at in my period are very specifically discussions about the idea that cannabis causes a discrete form of mental illness that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't smoked cannabis. So that's one form of discussion. Nowadays, we don't actually say cannabis psychosis. We, from my best of my knowledge, is not a practitioner, but historian is, use the term either cannabis use disorder or cannabis-induced psychosis. The idea that it's not cannabis that causes mental illness, but possibly aggravates an underlying mental health issue, which perpetuates. But what you've also got then is a completely parallel, if related, discussion about the relationship between cannabis and schizophrenia, i.e., does cannabis cause schizophrenia or is cannabis an indicative of possible future schizophrenia, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just two, the two most prominent discussions, right? And that, I guess, again, feeds into what Dag Finn was saying about junk science. It's the fact that like, it isn't as easy as saying cannabis causes this or cannabis causes that. It's the fact that actually, you know, even people that are on the forefront of discussions about cannabis and mental illness are still untangling what cannabis actually contributes to different forms of mental illness. And I think that's really important to bear in mind that it isn't just cannabis makes you crazy because actually that, that is, or one, it's not helpful and it's an archaic, but two, it doesn't actually get to just how complex an issue it actually is. So yeah, sorry for riding over you there, Ambrose. That's, that's okay. Just maybe, uh, Dagfin, you could help us on this. Do you see similar patterns, patterns like we see in the UK around, uh, racialized policing of uh, cannabis use in, in Norway? Uh, I would say yes. Um, so um, not every area in Norway um, is uh, racially diverse. Uh, I mean, as racially diverse as the large cities, but uh, we have data from, from Oslo, which is perhaps the most relevant, um, showing that Consumption of cannabis is much higher um, in the western part of Oslo, which is the affluent, um, you know, more of a majority ethnic uh, de demography. Um, and uh, yet the risk of being uh, punished for cannabis use or possession is higher among youth in the eastern parts where there is a much larger portion of minorities. Uh, and uh, specifically in some of the parts of Oslo that have a very high concentration of, of ethnic minorities, uh, there um, is a very high um, incidence of 
of possession prosecution in, in, in youth. So that is, uh, it's, it's the same, it's the same pattern. And, and we've, we've seen some different statistics breaking it down on uh, uh, metrics like uh, the um, education level of parents, um, that type of thing. And, and there was something like um, a, a sevenfold, in, uh, a sevenfold higher risk um, of um, being punished for, for cannabis uh, related offenses, use offenses in Norway, if, um, if your parents had um, no higher education. And yet the, the children of those with higher education consumed more cannabis on average than the, the, the former children, right? So it, it's as expected. Um, and you know, this is complex. Uh, there are elements of uh, profiling, there is prejudice, uh, there is the fact, like Nick said, that, that it's easy. And it's also easier to go after um, demographic groups that are disadvantaged or that are not as privileged, obviously, right? And it's also easier to discover um, because, you know, drug use is a private offense. There is no uh, victim. So that means that if no one is pressing charges other than the police, the police have to discover the crime. And they discover the crime by, you know, stopping you on the street and claiming that your pupils are dilated, right? But, but they can also discover it in your, in your home or, you know, they can search your car or whatever. And all these things are easier to do uh, in neighborhoods that are more frequently policed because of higher crime rates or whatever. And also it, it's easier to do towards people who are not going to uh, talk to your boss and have you fired afterwards, right? It, it, all of these mechanisms just, just combine. Uh, into a perfect storm of, of discrimination. Um, it's, it's as if it were designed for it. Uh, turning to Rob, Rob, uh, Leicester is uh, possibly the, the most diverse city in Europe. Uh, and uh, I, I suspect, I've not looked at the statistics for Leicester, but I suspect that uh, what we are seeing at a national level is also playing out in Leicester. How should the city respond. I'm a bit off the pace with this, and I think others may know better than I do, but I, I recognize much of what you're saying, Ambrose, and what others have said. Um, I was involved marginally, as was Nick, in a piece of research some years ago, uh, not many years ago, about the incidence of stop search and the effect that this had. So as Dagfin has said, maybe you, you, you can uh, call on people's houses and find them in possession, but one of the most single most common reasons for uh, stopping and searching people was this belief that you could smell cannabis. So you have this vision of uh, a police officer walking past someone on a summer's evening and they say, oh, I, I smell cannabis and, you know, th this kind of, of stuff. And as Nick has raised the question in the Times article that I've um, quoted uh, uh, earlier on, um, what effect does this have on the relationship with the police in that community? If you and your friends are constantly being hassled, here's the police who are trying to cultivate a different kind of relationship with their community. And other countries, um, uh, I think, have sometimes looked to the United Kingdom to get a, a sense of how community policing might be done. So the police, I think, are keen to present themselves as a service at the service of the community rather than a force imposing its views upon a community but that seems to be completely neglected when it comes to this this topic which makes me feel that it isn't just as it happens that it is seem that it is serving some kind it's about reminding people about their place whether that's race whether that's social class or most likely it's the intersections between those those two phenomena and I think that's certainly acute in Leicester, as, as in many other parts of the country. Anything to add? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I, I, I agree with what's been said, and and certainly that's replicated across the country, but it's also replicated, I would say, um, across Europe. One of the things that we have in the UK that we lack in other countries in Europe, because of historical reasons and because of some legislation, is data on racial background or ethnicity uh, and again that even maybe is by design uh, because if there's no data then you can just deny that there's a problem which is what we see in uh, in uh, in france for in, for instance but there's some studies in all of that i just made a quick list 
um, studies, Finland, France, Netherlands, Belgium, Spain. Um, I've been involved in all of those places where as a proxy, you see, as has been mentioned, the use of police initiated stops on the street. Many of those are for drugs, although also in Europe, they are, for ID they are identity checks as well. Um, and the two often, you know, you know, combine. And the disparity there is, is clearly obvious. Um, the data is limited, but there is some data and some research that demonstrates that that is the case. But um, I've, we've also done some studies, you know, where simply you get people to share their actual experience of getting stopped and getting stopped because they think they might be dealing drugs or might have got drugs or whatever. Um, and, you know, the picture, the pattern is very, very similar, sadly. And there's even, I mean, I know some black police officers in the Netherlands who one guy got stopped so many times in his car that, uh, and this was all around, you know, he, he lives in an area where apparently there's lots of drug dealing going on. Got so many, so many times in his car, he was advised to change his car. So he did change his car. And then he still kept getting stopped. So he actually moved house to avoid that. And that's the Netherlands, which, you know, we often look to as a, as an example of, you know, good practice around, around uh, more liberal drug policy. So, um, so yeah, sadly, there's a, there's a pattern. And then, uh... Also, Nick, you, you, you suggested, you, you gave the example of uh, the former chief constable who said that uh, cannabis was not his priority, his force had other things to, to look at. I, I'm, I'm recalling this because uh, in Leicester, we've had conversations with uh, the police and crime commissioner, the current police and crime commissioner for Leicester and Leicestershire and Rutland who believes that uh, his job and the job of the police are to enforce the law. And yet, uh, given the problems that we have around, around cannabis, the, the thing to do would be to actually concentrate not on cannabis, but on the other issues. What can communities do to encourage uh, local police forces to, to change the approach? I mean, I think what local communities first need before they can do that is, is you know, the truth and accurate information about um, the harms or otherwise of people using drugs, which they are right now in Leicester. That's happening right now. And, and the impact of almost all of that is, is you know, zero. Um, people will enjoy themselves and have a good time and then and, and that is it there are no other consequences um, apart from all of the connections to the illegal market which we've already which we've already talked about I think for the police and crime commissioner who his job is to hold the chief constable to account um, it's about choices um, and if the PCC is saying that we need to enforce the law the question has to be well which laws because there are hundreds of thousands of them so which ones are you choosing to enforce and putting an emphasis on and why? And what has already been said, but I think it's important to repeat is take an evidence-based approach rather than a populist approach. The populist approach says be tough on crime, be tough on the causes of crime and drugs is an easy um, photo opportunity. Um, but yet other things are more important um, are, are more damaging, more harmful, more prevalent, um, and yet are ignored because they're more difficult to do. Um, so, you know, make better choices rather than the easy ones. Uh, and I think communities are not given the right information. Um, and, you know, they are given some information and then that is used, you know, their responses to half truths or inaccurate information is to suggest the wrong um, activity for policing. We really need to challenge that, I think. Any, anyone wants to, to, to add uh, on that, on what communities can do to bring about that shift? Uh, 
I, I just I just wanted to underscore Nick's point about yes, enforce the law, but yes, which law? Because there are so many laws. And we were saying that it was in the mid the decade between the mid nineties and the mid two thousands, uh, the, the the zeros. It was um, about a crime, a new crime every day. So the police can't enforce all the laws. So it's a question of which ones they choose to enforce and um, who they enforce them against is the other is the other matter. And in both of those things are, are tilted and skewed in ways that reflect very badly on us. But um, because the narrative in the community is that the police's job is to enforce the law and that's what they should do and that's what they are doing, it becomes very difficult. And I agree very much with what's been said that a, a good beginning would be to be rather more truthful, but politicians aren't always good at that, are they? How about Jamie and, uh, and Dr. Finn? Is there anything in your experience that uh, you think communities can do or should do or I mean, must do? I mean, to jump in, I guess, um, I don't know how much of it is necessarily on communities. I think part of it is really on creating trust with those communities uh, in the sense that in a, a long time ago, I was going to look, well, a year ago, I was going to look at uh, approaches to harm reduction in the Caribbean. And something that kind of came out of that reading was very much just the complete lack of trust that many communities had in kind of police officers and their enforcement of laws in Jamaica. Now, Jamaica isn't Britain, but the point I guess I'm raising is that like, yeah, on the one hand, I think it's really important that communities kind of like support each other, that communities, you know, don't vilify their own and kind of look after people that are dealing with drug related harms. Right. And that, you know, communities also push the government for things. And, I, you know, but then I'm also a realist in the sense of one, I don't think things will change unless it's in the government's interest to change. You know, I would be surprised if we have a referendum on it while there's a Tory government in not because I don't think there should be one, but because is it really in their political interest to do it, right? And by extension, it's that sense of, it's all well and good people pushing for change, but it also needs to be, there needs to be systems of, systems of power need to be willing to change as well, right? And like I said, I'd like to go back to my initial point, I think on a very base level, you know, if you're gonna go and have community-based policing and you're gonna go and have community approaches, there needs to be trust amongst communities that police officers are acting in their best interest because i think that's being eroded right you know i i am luck i have the luxury in the sense that i am a white man who is you know currently employed at a university lives in a relatively nice bit of leicester doesn't have to worry about being picked up by a police officer because i'm black wearing a hoodie and might be carrying drugs right but you know my perspective on that is that that is a very real thing that people feel right and it's a very real thing that certain bits of the population felt for a very long time and until those members of the population feel like the police are actually acting in their interest rather than criminalizing them, then, you know, it's all, you know, communities can only really do so much, right? When they feel that the, the arms of the state that are there, you know, normally to protect them are not protecting them, you know, why would you, right? Do you know what I mean? Why would you kind of have any faith in the government and stuff? So, sorry, I realize I've gone on a bit of a tangent there, but I think that, you know, while it's good to be like, yes, communities need to do this or communities need to do that. I'm also of an attitude of like structures of power need to change as much as it is communities need to force those changes right and communities need to have faith in those structures of power. But that's my 10 cents anyway. Thank you, thank you. So um, I just posted a link to the chat, um, which is um, an English translation of a campaign that my organization ran in Norway uh, this last, year or in the, in the winter um, in, in leading up to this decriminalization bill. And my point is, is that um, to the extent that communities can do much, uh, and that is not a great extent, but um, individual voices uh, even can be heard through the media. And the power of, of stories is, is considerable. So what we did in our campaign was uh, tell stories about how criminalization causes harm and how it harms people we care about, uh, how it harms the people we have sympathy for and maybe our own youth and children. So, so if communities um, speak up in the media about how uh, current policing practices, how current drug laws are harming their communities, 
um, in sympathetic ways and the sympathetic stories. Um, I think that can have a major impact because sadly, politics these days, or politics always, I guess, but right now the lensing of the social media um, algorithms is, is quite extreme. It, it's driven by stories and uh, anecdotes and um, emotion. So you have to appeal to that emotion. Uh, I think maybe the legalization question is going to be dictated by other um, other factors like capital uh, and also you know economic uh, areas like the EU, for instance. There will be waves throughout the EU from Germany legalizing. Uh, but the decriminalization question is more about uh, appealing to our sense of humanity and our sense of uh, yeah reasonableness, I guess. And, and Rob, you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, I think Dag, Dagvin has put it very eloquently and those I would have thought might be very suitable closing words. I was just gonna make the rather mischievous point, if you'll forgive me, which when Jamie spoke about a referendum, um, I worry because my recent experience as a Brit is that referendums don't always turn out in the way that you would hope, especially when you are given uh, when complex issues are reduced to silly binary yes no questions because as Dagvin has said how this is done if it was framed as a question should we legalize cannabis or decriminalize cannabis I fear what the outcome of that would be um, and it's a it's a very poor question isn't it it's not a good question to pose anyway so it, it's only that reflection and I'm I'm partly teasing Jamie but uh, clearly we need to have a, a mature political debate about it and that's it's not apparent to me that that's taking place Can and then add our, quick? oh yes sorry sure. i just had a, an apropos to that our experience and with the decriminalization process here was exactly that uh people don't understand what the hell decriminalization means uh, and, and it is a sort of a nuanced thing, right? It's still illegal, but it's not a criminal offense. There are no criminal sanctions, but there are reactions. Uh, this is not an easy thing to, to, to present in a tabloid format. And I actually think that the legalization debate is much easier to present in that sense. It's more radical, but it's much more understandable to most people. And then we'll take one question from, from the audience before we close. Is there anyone who wants to say something or ask a question? before we close. I will take it that uh, everyone is happy. So, yes, okay. Um, I'd just like to um, thank the participants very much for a most um, interesting and stimulating discussion. Um, this is not my field, but I have um, enjoyed it enormously and I've learned a great deal. So thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. So we come back to, to you, our panelists. Uh, maybe if, do you have you know, final words? Let's start the way we started with Jamie. Um, I mean, my final words, I guess, are just, we, I mean, kind of to echo what everyone else says, I just think, we need to know more about the debate that we're having or like hopefully we'll be having. And that I think, you know, in the relatively, relatively privileged positions that we're in, we need to do all we can to kind of help those discussions. And that's hopefully something I can do in the future. But yeah, I think information is just key. We need to know. And, and Nick? Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody. It's been Good discussion i think um i would just um i would just answer the question at the start which was should britain legalize cannabis and my answer is yes and i think in this discussion we've heard a very um sort of insightful um we've had some really insightful pieces into what that actually means what we need to do um what we need to consider because it's not the flicking of a switch um and learning the lessons from the Netherlands of 30 years ago, but also of, um, you know, Germany just taking a decision with a new government very recently. I think, um, uh, I think we can, 
skip a load of the mistakes that have been made and do a good job. Uh, and I hope we do. Thank you, thank you. And then Rob. I'd like to thank everybody as well, and particularly you, Ambrose, for making it all possible and bringing us all together, because none of this would have happened without you. So thank you. Uh, my final point would I be that I think cannabis is a conspicuous example of a much wider principle that often focusing on reducing bad behavior or undesirable behavior through the forces of crime and punishment and coercion and threat actually misfires very, very badly in many occasions. And perhaps further reflection on cannabis might encourage us to extend that principle, not just to, to, to the drugs uh, question, but perhaps to other aspects of, of, of human conduct. And finally, uh, Dakin. Thank you. Yes, I'm just very grateful to uh, have been able to participate. I, I thank you all for that. Uh, thank you for listening. And um, I, I would echo the sentiments of the previous speakers. I, I think we're uh, generally moving in the right direction in this area of policy in the world. Uh, I, I think that um, sort, sort of on both sides of the political aisle, there is movement towards more sensible approaches to drugs. Uh, but I do fear, of course, that the, some of the uh, the political tendencies that have crept up and, and also in the West in the, in the past years uh, are, are worrying. Um, there can be backlashes uh, at any point in time. Um, I think that um, we have to be, if we want, want to see political change, whether it be decriminalization or legalization of cannabis, we, we need to be cognizant of the, the mechanisms of the public debate. We have to realize that uh, while it is always sensible to to look for uh, the rational solutions, uh, merely presenting the rational solutions is not going to get much done in terms of con convincing the, the general public um, because there is a game being play played and those wanting to affect the game have to play by its rules. So um, telling stories and using, um, you know, the, the, the kind of rhetoric that actually works uh, is important. And, um, and of course, also doing what everyone can to to actually enlighten the public debate, but that's getting more and more difficult these days, unfortunately. So, so yeah, on that gloomy note, thank you. And uh, on that note, I will say uh, thank you all for for attending uh, the session, and also thank you to our speakers. Uh, the event, like I said at the beginning, is part of the Leicester Human Rights Arts and Film Festival. Uh, this video will be uploaded to Civic Leicester on YouTube where we can continue, hopefully continue the discussion in that format. I'm also hoping that uh, we'll have follow-up events around this topic because this topic is not going to go away very soon. So on that note, I will say thank you and good night. And if I could also ask uh, our speakers to you know, just stay behind for five minutes and then we, yeah. So thank you everyone. Have a lovely rest of uh, the evening and uh, all the best for the Christmas festivities. Thank you. <laughs>